Hi everyone, this is Miss Brooks yet again on my YouTube channel for um, NTA Days. Um, I just want to, before we get started with the book reading again, I just want to clarify a few things. Um, if you don't have your packet yet, if you don't end up getting your packet by tomorrow afternoon or Saturday, please let me know and I'll try and see where that package is because um, it's going to have a lot of the stuff that we're going to keep doing. Um, anything in the packet is going to be all the way through April 17th because that's what, that's how long the governor has suggested we keep um, staying at home. Um, again, things are always up to change. Um, just keeping you updated on that. Um, Another thing, social studies will start again next week. Um, today is Thursday, uh, the 26th. Um, this afternoon at 6 o'clock, um, if you have, if your parents have Facebook or if you're following the Instagram, the new Instagram, you guys will see that we have a parade. So the teachers are going to be in their cars and we're going to drive around and just stay on your porches or your driveways, please, if you do end up seeing us. Um, some routes. Um, I know we're taking Howardstown, New Hope. There's a, there's a few other places, but um, we'd love to see you guys out there. If you can't, that's fine. Um, we'll just have to see. Um, so let's go ahead and... Um, and get started with the King Chronicles. You guys should have listened to the other audio recording for chapter four, but I'm going to go over it again real quick. Um, this one was a slightly shorter chapter. Um, I also picked this book because there are more chapters and it is a little more lengthy, but I do believe that this is a really interesting book. And when I first read it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. And um, they keep up with a lot of the accuracies with um, Egyptian mythology um, and then mix fantasy with it. So that's what I really like about it. You should have read chapter four. Chapter four um, was kidnapped by a not so stranger. Um, so basically... It starts off, they they finally come down as a family, um, down onto the living room sofa. Gran has some awful tea and biscuits, just putting that out there. Um, so there was Gran Gramps, Carter, Sadie, the inspector, and a few policemen. And the inspector was like, all right, none of these kids are telling me the truth. Um, something's got to be done. And their first reaction is they need to go to prison. But all of a sudden, the inspector starts changing his mind. Like, he goes blank. And he's like, well, you're both being deported. You're both American citizens. You need to leave the country. I think it's better than prison. Which confuses everybody at that point. But then as soon as the inspector turns to leave, they see the, um, the figure... Um, Amos. They see Amos again, and he just says, well, we need to talk when everybody leaves. And Amos is like, all right, so I made, I, I changed his mind. Um, you're coming with me to Brooklyn, to my mansion. And of course, Sadie does not like that idea, but ultimately, all of the family knows that that's the best option and apparently, Amos and Gran and Gramps had a deal to begin with about protection, and they had a deal with Julius, and he said, Julius broke that deal tonight, so they're officially coming with me. Um, so eventually, they're like, yes, um, let's go. Um, they're like, well, it, it, it'll take too long if we do a plane, we're gonna, and he magically conjures up a boat in the River Thames, um, an Egyptian boat, obviously. Amos didn't realize the 
Sadie's gift, I guess you could say, of translating hieroglyphs as soon as she sees them. Um, but then if you look on page 48, like right at the very end, um, it's, uh, who are you? Um, we can't just get go off with some stranger. I'm not a stranger. I'm family. And then Sadie remembers him being at a birthday of hers when she was little. And it turns out it's Julius Cain, Cain's brother. So um, Amos is Carter and Sadie's uncle. And, of course, we know Muffin. Muffin's acting all weird because she's like, all right, let's go, let's go, let's go. So that's where... We ended out. Um, so that last chapter was in Sadie's point of view. Now we're going back into Carter's point of view. Um, chapter five. This is a longer chapter, but we'll keep things going. We beat the monkey is what the chapter is called. So in my, when I first read this, I was like, why would there be a monkey when... We're talking about ancient Egypt. I want you guys to start thinking of why. It's Carter again. Sorry. We had to turn off the tape for a while because we were being followed by... Well, we'll get to that later. Sadie was telling you how we left London, right? So anyway, we followed Amos down to the weird boat docked at the... Um, down at the K-side. So K-side is a little weird as far as how it's spelled. Um, weird boat. It's a reed boat. So the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians with their boats, they were very thin and elongated, and they were very like flat on top and pointed near the tops. So that's that's what a reed boat was. So that's what he magically conjured up. I cradled Dad's work bag under my arm. I still couldn't believe he was gone. I felt guilty leaving London without him, but I believed Amos. I believed Amos about one thing. Right now, Dad was beyond our help. I didn't trust Amos, but I figured if I wanted to find out what happened to Dad, I was going to have to go along with him. He was the only one who seemed to know anything. Amos stepped aboard the reed boat. Sadie jumped right on, but I hesitated. I'd seen boats like this on the Nile before, but they never seemed very sturdy. So, no, they're usually not very sturdy, especially if they're thin in the middle. That would scare me to death. It was basically woven together from coils of plant fiber, like a giant floating rug. I figured the, t the torches at the front couldn't be a good idea, because if we didn't sink, we'd burn. At the back, the tiller was manned by a little guy wearing Amos's black trench coat and hat. The hat was shoved down on his head so I couldn't see his face. His hands and feet were lost in the folds of the coat. How does this thing move? I asked Amos. You've got no sail. Trust me, Amos offered me a hand. The night was cold, but when I stepped on board, I suddenly felt warmer as if the torchlight were casting a protective glow over us. In the middle of the boat was a hut made out of wooden mats. From Sadie's arms, Muffin sniffed at it and growled. Take a seat inside, Amos suggested. The trip might be a little rough. I'll stand, thanks, Sadie nodded with, at the little guy in the back. Who's your driver? Amos acted as if he didn't hear the question. Hang on, everyone. He nodded to the steerman, and the boat lurched forward. So, no, it doesn't look sturdy, but just a, a hut just appeared, and he's like, all right, go inside. This is going to be rough. The feeling was hard to describe. You know that tingle in the pit of your stomach when you're on a roller coaster, and it goes into free fall? It was kind of like that, except we weren't falling, and the feeling didn't go away. The boat moved astounding, with astounding speed. The lights of the city blurred when we were swallowed in, the, in a thick fog. <sighs> Sorry, it's been rough, guys. <laughs> Some of you guys are probably reading in your pajamas or something like that. Who knows? 
Strange sounds echoed in the dark, slithering and hissing, distant screams, voices whispering in languages I didn't understand. The tingling turned into nausea. The sounds got louder until I was about to scream myself. Until I was about to scream myself. Then suddenly the boat slowed. The noises stopped and the fog dissipated. City lights came back, brighter than before. Above us loomed a bridge, much taller than any bridge in London. My stomach did a slow roll. To the left, I saw a familiar skyline. The Chrysler Building. The Empire State Building. Impossible, I said. That's New York. Sadie looked as green as I felt. She was still cradling Muffing, whose eyes were closed. The cat seemed to be purring. It can't be, Sadie said. We only traveled a few minutes. And yet here we are. Here we were, sailing up to the East River, right under the Williamsburg Bridge. We glided to a stop next to a small dock on the Brooklyn side of the river. In front of us was an industrial yard filled with piles of scrap metal and old construction equipment. In the center of it all, right at the water's edge, rose a huge factory warehouse heavily painted with graffiti and windows boarded up. That is not a mansion, Sadie said. Her powers of perception are really amazing. Look again, Amos pointed at the top of the building. How, how did you, my voice failed me. I wasn't sure why I hadn't seen it before, but now it was obvious. A five-story mansion perched at the top of the warehouse like another layer of a cake. You couldn't build a mansion up there. Long story, said Amos, but we needed a private location. And is this the East Shore? Sadie asked. You said something about that in London. My grandparents living on the East Shore. Amos smiled. Yes, very good, Sadie. In ancient times, the East Bank of the Nile was always the side of the living and the side where the sun rises. The dead were buried west of the river. It was considered bad luck, even dangerous to live there. The tradition is still strong among our people. Our people, I asked, but Sadie muscled in with another question. So before we get to that question, I do want to mention, yes, this was a lot of, you see the pyramids are always on the west side of the river. So like, um, if you're looking at the map, say you're looking at the map, um, it's on the west side. So if you're staring at my screen right now, um, this side would be where the dead were. Here would be the Nile, and then here would be the um, the living. So Valley of Kings and the pyramids were always on the right side, like always on the west side. Remember that because that's going to be on your test. Um, of course, there were some cities over there, but the dead were always buried on the other side. So you can't live in Manhattan, she asked. Amos' brow furrowed as, it, as he looked across at the Empire State Building. Manhattan has other problems. Other gods. It's best we stay separate. Other what? Sadie demanded. Nothing. Amos walked past us to the, steer, to the steersman. I wonder what he's talking about. If you think, where did, where was Mount Olympus equivalent? For Percy Jackson. Empire State Building. That's a subtle reference to the other book that he did. Um, he plucked off the bit hat and coat, and there was no one underneath. The steersman simply wasn't there. Amos put on his fedora, folded his coat under his arm, and then waved towards the metal staircase that, that wound all the way up this side to the warehouse to the mansion on the roof all ashore he said 
and welcome to the to the 21st gnome. Gnome? I asked as if as we followed him up the stairs, like those little runty guys. Heavens no, Amos said. I hate gnomes. They smell horrible. But you said gnome, N-O-M-E, um, as in a district, a region. The term is from ancient times when Egypt was divided into 42 provinces or 42 cities, essentially. Today, the system is a little different. We've gone global. The world is divided into three, 360 gnomes. Egypt, of course, is the first. Greater New York is the 21st. Sadie glanced at me and twirled her finger around, the, around her temple. So she's basically like doing this. No, Sadie, Amos said without looking back. I'm not crazy. There's much you need to learn. We reached the top of the stairs, looking up at the mansion. It was hard to understand what I was seeing. The house was at least 50 feet tall, built of enormous limestone blocks and steel-framed windows. There, there were hieroglyphs ingrained around the windows, and the walls were lit up. So the place looked like a cross between a modern museum and an ancient temple. But the weirdest thing was was that if I glanced away, the whole building seemed to disappear. I tried it several times, just to be sure. If I looked for the mansion of the corner of my eye, it wasn't there. I had to force my eyes to focus on it. And even that took a lot of willpower. Amos stopped before the entrance, which was the size of a garage door, a dark, heavy square of timber with no visible handle or lock. Carter, after you. Um, how do I, how do you think? Great, another mystery. I thought, I thought about, I was about to suggest we ram Amos' Amos's head against it and see if that worked. Then I looked at the door again, and I had the strangest feeling. I stretched out my arm slowly, without touching the door. I raised my hand, and the door followed my movement, sliding upward until it disappeared into the ceiling. Sadie looked stunned. stunned. How? I don't know, I admitted, a little embarrassed. Motion sensor, maybe? <laughs> Um, interesting. Amos sounded a little troubled. Not the way I would have done it, but very good. Remark remarkably good. Thanks, I think. Sadie tried to go inside, inside first, but as soon as she stepped on the threshold, Muffin wailed and almost crawled her way out of Sadie's arms. Sadie stumbled backwards. What was that about, cat? Oh, of course. Amos said. My apologies. He put his hand on the cat's head and said, very formally, you may enter. The cat needs permission, I asked. Special circumstances, Amos said, which wasn't, a, which wasn't much of an explanation. But he walked inside without, any word, any, uh, without another word. We followed, and this time Muffin stayed quiet. Oh my god. <laughs> Sadie's jaw dropped. She craned her neck to look at the ceiling, and I thought the gum might fall out of her mouth. Yes, Amos said, this is the great room. I could see why he called it that. The cedar-beamed ceiling was four stories high, held up by, a carved, by carved stone pillars engraved with hieroglyphs. A weird assortment of a musical instruments and ancient Egyptian weapons decorated the walls. Three levels of balconies ringed the room, with rows, with rows of doors all looking around the main area. The fireplace was big enough to park a car in it, with a plasma screen TV above the mantel and a mass and massive leather sofas on either side. On the floor was a snakeskin rug, except it was 
It was 40 feet long and 15 feet wide, bigger than any snake. Yes, that is quite large. Outside, through the glass walls, I could see the terrace that wrapped around the house. It had a swimming pool, dining area, and a blazing fire pit. And at the far end of the great, the great room was a set of double doors mar marked with the eye of Horus and chained with half a dozen padlocks. If you remember, Carter's pendant is the eye of Horus. Um, I wondered what could possibly be be behind them, but the real showstopper was the statue in the middle of the great of the great room. It was a thirty feet tall. It was thirty feet tall, made of black marble. I could tell it was an Egyptian god. It was of an Egyptian god because the figure had a human body with an animal's head. Like a stork or a crane with a long neck and a really long beak. Now, I want you to think about what that is because we have two, at least two gods that we've learned about that have that same physical appearance. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see. The god was dressed in ancient style, was dressed in ancient style in a kilt, sash, and neck collar. He held a scribe's stylus in one hand and an open scroll in the other, as if he would just written the hieroglyphs inscribed there. An onk, the Egyptian looped cross with a rectangle traced around its top. That's it, Sadie exclaimed, pair onk. I stared at her in disbelief. All right, how can you read that? I don't know, she said, but it's obvious, isn't it? The top one is shaped like the floor plan of the house. How did you get that? It's just a box. The thing was, she was right. I recognized the symbol, and it was supposed to be a simplified picture of the house with, um, with a doorway. But it wouldn't be obvious to most people, especially people named Sadie. Yet, she looked absolutely positive. It's a house, she insisted. And the bottom of the picture is the Ankh, the symbol for life. Pear Ankh, the house of life. Very good, Sadie. Amos looked impressed. And this is the statue of the only god still allowed in the house of life. At least, normally. Do you recognize him, Carter? Just then, it clicked. The bird was an ibis, an Egyptian river bird. Thoth, I said, the god out of knowledge. He invented writing. So, it's not um, Horus, and it's not Ra. So, this is Thoth, the god of, the god of knowledge. So, if you know what a... Um, Let's see. And if this looks like, it's kind of like a crane. So it has a really thin, narrow beak. Um, let me see if I can find a picture on my phone. Hold on. Let's see. Sorry this is taking a while, guys. Okay, so this is what Thoth looks like. Now, obviously, he doesn't have the um, scribing tablet in this picture, but you can see he has a crane-like head. Um, I want you to relate that with what Julius Cain usually does. He studies, and he's an Egyptologist, so that kind of makes sense. Indeed, said Amo, Amo said. Why the animal heads? Sadie asked. All those Egyptian gods have animal heads. They look so silly. They don't normally appear that way, Amos said. Not in real life. Real life? I asked. Come on, you sound like you've met them in person. Amos' expression didn't reassure me. He, he looked as if he were remembering something unpleasant. The gods could appear in any forms, usually fully human or fully animal. 
but occasionally as a hybrid form like this. They are primal forces, you, you understand, a sort of bridge between humanity and nature. They are depicted with animal heads to show that they exist in two different worlds at once. Do you understand? Not even a little, said Sadie said. Hmm. Amos didn't sound surprised. Yes, we have much training to do. At any rate, the god before you, Thoth, founded the House of Life, for which this mansion is a is the regional headquarters, or at least it used to be. I'm the only member left in the 21st gnome. Or I was until you two came along. Hang on. I had so many questions I could hardly think on where to start. What is the house of life? Why is Thoth the only god allowed here? And why are you... Carter, I understand how you feel. Amos smiled <laughs> sympathetically. But these things are better discussed in daylight. You need to get some sleep, and I don't want you to have my nightmares. You think I can sleep? Meow. Muffin scream stretched in Sadie's arms and let loose a huge yawn. Um, Amos clapped his hands. Khufu. I thought he'd sneeze, but Khufu is a weird name. But then a little dude about three feet tall with gold fur and a purple shirt came clambering down the stairs it took me a few seconds to realize it was a baboon wearing an L.A. Lakers jersey. So, again, we're talking about um, baboons were also prominent in ancient Egypt as different symbols. This is Khufu. Uh, the baboon did a flip and landed in front of us. He showed, he showed off his fangs and made a sound that was half roar, half belch. His breath smelled like nacho-flavored Doritos. All I could think to say was, The Lakers are my home team! The baboon slapped his head with both hands and belched again. Oh, Khufu likes you, Amos said. You'll get along f famously. Right, Sadie looked dazed. You've got a monkey butler. Why not? Muffin purred in Sadie's arms as if the baboon didn't bother her at all. Ah! Khufu grunted at me. Amos chuckled. He d he wants to go one-on-one -on -one with you, Carter, to uh, see your game. I shifted from foot to foot. Um, yeah, sure. Maybe tomorrow? But how can you understand? Carter, I'm afraid you'll have a lot to get used to, Amos said. But if you're going to survive and, sa and save your father, you have to get some rest. Sorry, Sadie said. Did you say survive and save our father? Could you expand on that? Tomorrow, Amos said. We'll begin your orientation in the morning. Khufu, show them to their rooms, please. I'm not going to grunt like a baboon, but the baboon grunted. <laughs> he turned and waddled up the stairs. Unfortunately, the Lakers jersey didn't completely cover his multicolored rear, so his bullet. We were, we were about to follow when Amo said, Carter, the work bag, please. It's best if I lock it in the library. I hesitated. I'd almost forgotten the bag on my shoulder. But it was all I had left of my father. I didn't have our luggage because it was still locked up in the British Museum. Honestly, I'd been surprised that the police hadn't taken the work bag too, but none of them seemed to notice it. You'll get it back, Amos promised, when the time is right. He asked nicely enough, but something in his eyes told me that I really didn't have a choice. I handed over the bag. Amos looked at it gingerly as if it were full of explosives. See you in the morning. He turned and strode towards the chained up doors. They unlatched themselves and opened just enough for Amos to slip through without showing us anything on the other side. Then the chains locked again behind him. I looked at Sadie, unsure on what to do. Staying by ourselves in the great room 
with a creepy, creepy statue of Thoth didn't seem like much fun. So we followed Khufu up the stairs. Sadie and I adjoin, got adjoined rooms on the third floor. And I've got to admit, they were way cooler than any place I'd stayed before. I had my own kitchenette fully stocked with my favorite snacks, ginger ale. No, said he. It's not an old person soda. Be quiet. Twix and Skittles. It seemed impossible. How did Amos know what I liked? The TV, computer, and stereo system were totally high tech. The bathroom was stocked with my regular brand of toothpaste, deodorant, everything. The king size bed was awesome, too, though the pillow was a little strange. Instead of a cloth pillow, it was it was an ivy ivory head headrest like I'd seen in the Egyptian tombs. It was decorated with lions and, of course, more hieroglyphs. The room even had a deck that looked out to the New York Harbor, with views of Manhattan and the Statue of Liberty in the distance, but the sliding glass doors were locked shut somehow. That was my first in indi indication that something was wrong. I turned to look at Khufu, but he was gone. The door, the door to my room was shut. I tried to open it, but it was locked. I muffled, a muffled voice came through the next room. Cardi? Sadie? I tried to op I, I tried the door to her adjoining room, but it was locked too. We're prisoners, she said. Do you think Amos, I mean, can we trust him? After all I'd seen today, I didn't trust anything, but I could hear the fear in Sadie's voice. It triggered an unfamiliar feeling in me, like I, I needed to reassure her. The idea seemed ridiculous. Sadie had always seemed so much braver than me, doing what she wanted, never caring about the consequences. I was the one who got scared. The, but right now, I felt like I needed to play a role I hadn't played in a long, long time. Big brother. It'll be okay. I tried to sound confident. Look, if Amos wants to hurt us, he could have done it by now. Try to get some sleep. Carter? Yeah? It was magic, wasn't it? What happened to Dad at the museum? Amos' boat? This house? All of it's magic. I think so. I could hear her sigh. Good. At least I'm not going mad. Don't let the bed bugs bite, I called. And I realized I hadn't said that to Sadie since we lived together in Los Angeles when Mom was still alive. I miss Dad, she said. I hardly ever saw him, I know, I know, but I miss him. My eyes got a little teary, but I took a deep breath. I was not going to go all week. Sadie needed me. Dad needed us. We'll find him, I told her. Pleasant dreams. I listened, but the only thing I heard was Muffin meowing and scampering around, exploring her, exploring her new space. At least she didn't seem unhappy. I got ready for bed and crawled in. The covers were co comfortable and warm, but the pillow was just too weird. It gave me neck cramps, so I put it on the floor and went to sleep without it. My first big mistake. So I'm wondering how, um, why he said that was his first big mistake was not sleeping with the pillow. Um, the next chapter is Breakfast with a Crocodile. So some of you guys are already getting an idea, on, okay, what does the crocodile mean? Um, again, read chapter six. I'm going to put the link of the other audio in the, um, in the, description below and if you have questions feel free to let me know um so far i'm loving it um i always have it's really interesting and it's something completely different here's um i want to tell you guys this too hopefully um we get a google hangout set up for tomorrow i know you guys have one with miss hirsch around 11 I'm thinking around 2 or 2.30, a Google Hangout. If you're available and want to come to that, please email me. Um, 
do not dojo me because I, I always think it's your parents dojoing me. Um, and if they have questions, feel free just to let me know. All right. Bye, guys.